Hello, and welcome to a very special edition of the Jay Duke Show on Horse Network. Today, we have a panel of guests, and we're going to talk about safety equipment for equestrians uh, when they're riding their beautiful horses. And this is definitely a, a big, big topic in the equestrian world right now. We're going to be focusing a lot on the safety vests and the technology behind them. And, you know, should you wear a safety vest or should you not? We're going to be discussing that. And so this this is a big one because safety is is so important to for riders out there. You know, we have so many kids riding and adults riding and whether it's protecting your head or whether it's protecting your back or your body or whatever it is, it is really a key factor. So I have an amazing panel lined up today for you to listen to. And it's going to be a very, very interesting discussion. We have guests from from France and guests from North America, and it, it's going to be a lot of fun. So thank you so much for joining us for this very special episode. I want to thank Horse Network for making this happen. Uh, their support is just absolutely wonderful, and I greatly appreciate it. Um, we're you know, putting these panels together and bringing you this sort of education information that hopefully enhances your equestrian experience, and Horse Network is such a big part of that. And I also want to thank the Equivault.com, that it is your biggest online resource for show jumping exercises. There's over 400 lessons online. It gives you a map of your arena. It gives you the instructions. gives you what you need to have, you know, how many poles, how many standards, how many, how much fill and all that. And there's lessons there from Grand Prix training to gymnastics to preparing for McClay finals to novice riders to amateur riders to hunter derbies to young horses to lead changes. Everything you could want to learn is going to be on the Equivault.com. So please check them out. So I'm going to start to bring our guests on. We've got four panelists joining us today, and it's the first time we've ever done that. So that's that's an exciting one for us. So we're going to start off. We have Catherine Winters joining us. She is the founder and owner of Ride Equisafe. And the purpose of Ride Equisafe is to educate and inform people on safety products. And they specialize in body protectors, air vest, safety stirrups. So thank you to Catherine for joining us. We have Marie Lester here joining us. She is the export manager for Horse Pilot for the last three years. Um, they've designed the first airbag that was designed for riders specifically, um, not you know not taken from another sport and, and just kind of made into for riders. They, they actually designed it for equestrians. And Marie's joining us from France. And also with her is Pierre Francois, who is in a motion founder and engineer that has helped Horse Pilot design these safety vests. So that was going to be very interesting to hear the technology from him behind the products. And then we also have, um, let's see, sorry, one more, Daniel Santos, there she is, <laughs> Vice President of Sales for <laughs> Charles Owen. And Charles Owen is such a big name in, in the business. And thank to Danielle, she's going to be educating us on what Charles Owen is doing to help keep riders safe. So thank you so much for everyone for joining us today. And, ha and how is everyone? Good. We're great. Thanks for having Good. us. Thanks, Thanks for having you. us. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much for, for joining us. And I want to start off with, we're obviously, we're, we're focusing on the vest because that's a fairly new thing in the show jumping world. Um, it's, you know, cross country riders have been wearing them for a, for a while now, but in the show jumpers, that's, that's pretty new. Really, it's new as of 2021, essentially. And so I want to I want to start with that. So there's two types of vests. There's the protective vest and there's an inflatable vest. And I want to begin with what is the difference between those two things? So let's start with with Catherine. And I want to hear, you know, what is the difference between an inflatable vest and a protective vest? Sure. Thanks, Jay. Um, so the key differences are, first of all, um, a protective vest is made of some type of foam in most cases of, of different constructions, depending on the, the brand and the model. Um, they're really fantastic for energy dissipation, shock absorption, impact absorption. Um, and one of the big things about body protectors is that they are fail safe. You wear them and they do what they're supposed to do. Um, with an air vest, an air vest is kind of like a wearable air mattress, if you will. Um, it is attached to a saddle strap on your saddle and it deploys in the event that you were to separate from your horse and it inflates and provides protection 
um, to the torso area, neck, hips, tailbone, ribs. Um, again, it's kind of like falling on an air mattress, but the key with this one is that it's a mechanical system. So it does require a chain of events to occur um, in order for it to deploy. Um, they both do different things and there are some overlaps. There are things that an air vest is great for and then there are things that a body protector is better for. So whenever people ask me what's the safest thing, my response is nearly always wear both. Um, but we know, especially in the hunter jumper market, people are tending to choose one or the other. So we're just trying to inform and educate so that they're making an informed decision. Um, but I'd love to invite the others to share anything that I may have missed or some thoughts on body protectors and air Marie, vests as well. Marie, let's go to you. So the difference, what's the difference between the body protector and, and the inflatable vest? Well, I totally agree with Catherine. It's two different uh, protection products and uh, one as a purpose, the other one as another one. So it's true what she says is that you can wear both. You can choose between one or the other. We, um, we chose the airbag vest, so the one that is inflating, because we wanted to bring a lot of comfort to the, for the riders. Uh, we are seeing riders as athletes, so we wanted them to have a protection that was very comfortable, that they will not bother them because they are athletes, so they need to move, they need to be comfortable when they ride. So that's why we went for the airbag vest, the infla inflating one. Okay, so you just, you just focus just specifically on the internet. yes and this is why what we did is that we con we connected with in emotion who specialized in airbags mm -hmm. and we told them okay we would like to develop an airbag vest that is um designed for riders especially for horse riders because all the others on the market come from other disciplines and were sold into the equestrian industry. So we wanted to really uh, match the um, requirement for the riders and provide them an adapted, adapted product. Uh, so for all the technology, Pierre-Francois will uh, explain you better all the technical details, but that's what we did for horse pilots. Uh, Dan Danielle, is, do you have a preference? Is one type of vest better than the other? So at Charles Owen, um, first of all, being a, a dedicated safety uh, company, we manufacture both body protectors as foundation garments, as well as um, air vests that connect to our body protection. Um, so the first thing I have to say is that no matter what you're wearing, the additional confidence that riders get from being able to put a vest on is extraordinary. So, you know, whether you choose an air vest or you choose a body protector that's a foundation garment, the additional confidence that riders get adds a level of safety to them. They ride better, they sit up straighter, they are, you know, as we know in hunters and jumpers, they're, they ride a little bit more forward, they have a better opportunity. So in asking if I have a preference, um, Actually, I see both products as being useful, best in conjunction with each other. But, you know, the certifications for horse riding accidents in the foundation garment, that's key. That is the EN 13158. And that particular uh, standard is based solely on horse riding accidents. And we all know that the trajectories are different. The speeds are different, whether you are on um, a horse or a motorcycle. So that becomes something that to me can, can make the decision one way or the other. That being said, we've created both and the, the ideal situation as Catherine said earlier, is if you are worried, both together is an ideal solution. And it's <clears throat> interesting ahead. what you say there about uh, creating confidence in the rider. Um, mm -hmm. So that's something which I had never, I hadn't thought of that that would be, yeah. you know, um, and I, I haven't worn, I mean, I don't compete anymore. So I, I wasn't around when safety vests, you know, safety vests weren't around when I was out there jumping and showing. Um, so that, that means a lot to me because confidence yeah. is such a big issue for, for so many riders and especially novice riders. Right. So that's, uh, that's really great to hear. Pierre, the technology that is that goes into these inflatable vests, um, 
how, how long ago did you start working on that and, and what's been that process to create the vest that you currently have today? Well, um, of course, it's, it's a new technology. We are only speaking about uh, wearable safety. Uh, we even invent a word to describe this. It's a, it's a contraction of wearable airbags called wearbags uh, because it's, it's like kind of different from airbags in a car. But basically, it's a technology that's... Um, appear uh, in the middle of the tw in the, the, two, the, 20, the 2000s, like, uh, like in 2005, 2006. Uh, it was just inspired by live vests for a uh, floating reason, uh, but trying to make them inflating much faster. Um, but now we really comes to, I would say, we comes to the questions a bit later than the answers. And the question is key for us as a, as a technology developer is try to understand the major injuries and try to understand the mechanism of injuries that leads to those injuries. Mm -hmm. Because if you want to avoid an injuries, you need to understand which type of injuries you have to fight again. And the interesting thing is the body is probably one of the, the most beautiful machines just after horses, of course. <laughs> um, and, and, and the way that we get injured is just the consequences of, of millions of years of evolutions. And you can get injured by an impact as well as a, as a torsion, as well as a frictions. So it's key to understand the key, the, the type of injuries you want to avoid. And we don't think that the best way is to think about the product. We just try to start, start from the injuries and look the best so technical solutions to try to reduce those injuries. As, as Catherine was saying, yes, um, if, you, if you are stamped by holes uh, on, laying on the ground, of course, a foam systems will, will be better. Uh, if you fall on um, a very sticky, uh, let's say, uh, uh, points, uh, it can be very hard for the, uh, the inflation systems and very, not so bad for the foam. At the opposite, if you lay on the ground and the horse is falling on you, then the, the inflate, inflatable cushion could be very interesting. The, 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 so the idea is try to mix, to use the best technology available to bring a good level of safety, including the fact that if you want to protect, you need to be warm. So a good protection, which is not one, is not a good protection. And, and um, in any case, when you are a top riders, as well as just having fun on weekend, you want to, to, you, you want to feel nice. You want to feel comfortable, of course, but you want to, just to forget this protection. So it's uh, really a mix in the equation of performance of production, comfort, and in some cases, the pricing. And the pricing now, after 15 years, uh, it makes the systems more and more, of a, uh, let's say, uh, uh, affordable. affordable. So that's that's the equation: comfort, performance of production, and pricing. Is there going to be the technology? And I'll stay with you, Pierre Francois, on this. Is there going to be the technology to have it all in one? Like, does it need to be two separate vests, or, or is one day we're going to be able to just put on one vest that's going to provide all of that protection for the equestrian? Yeah, of course, there, there is some some developments, and as I say, we try to to use every um, technology as a toolbox. Um, so if you if you think of an helmet, you have the hard shell outside and the absor uh, absorbing foam inside. So the hard shell avoid um, any uh, any uh, sharp part to penet penetrate inside, and and also try to um, redistribute the stress on the full foam. So in a way, um, an airbag could work the same. An airbag works very well uh, of an impact on a flat surface or between a, a flat and a horse. Uh, and then the, 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 the safety vest could be very interesting for the, the other part, for the very, uh, let's say, uh, stiff part. Another interesting thing is it's a question between active and passive. A passive safety is something that you wear anytime. So you have an helmet, you wear an helmet, and that's it. And an active safety is like ABS for a car or something that have to deploy, have to do something during the, the event of a crash. And if we want to lock, for example, we want to lock the neck to avoid... Um, my splash and, and neck injuries mm -hmm. you can't imagine to ride with your neck block like your neck brace in motorcycles like riding your horse like this <laughs> so in some case active like safety now. yeah exactly uh, so active safety in those cases can bring a level of protection that you can't imagine to wear in a passive situation so that's also the way we use those toolbox okay okay cool um, and and jay i'll mention yeah. too and danielle can jump in here Charles Owens Aeroware Company actually has a hybrid on the market already. It's called the AirPS. You, oh, you can wear okay. the body protector on its own, but it also serves as an anchor garment that their air shell, that's exactly the picture of it, that, the, uh, that their air shell air vest can zip onto. Um, so there is hybrid technology 
already on the market. And I think we're, we're going to see more of this as well as time goes by. Right. Danielle, follow up on that. Tell, tell us about this hybrid vest. So the RPS was designed um, a few years ago. So as Catherine said, the best scenario, the best safety scenario, especially in rotational falls, which this vest was specifically designed for our venters and the potential for rotational falls, it anchors the airbag to, or sorry, the air vest containing the airbag to the body protector, because if for some reason the air, the air vest shifts, you'll lose some level of protection. Um, and this is so key because you want to be able to be protected in your entire torso, essentially. And the RPS did allow for neck stabilization, which for us, we did it, designed it in conjunction with our helmets to lessen the severity of torsion um, or any sort of neck injuries. And then of course it came down lower to protect against the hip because as we see, riders do fall a lot of times on their shoulder, which is a collarbone break generally, and then on their hips, which you know can be a pelvic fracture or it can be a, um, a twisting of the spine. So like I said, that particular product was designed specifically for eventers. And I think that in the coming years with new materials, the hybrid will be something that we, we work on and with thinner materials because that particular product, eventers are, are really used to putting on their air jacket over top of their foundation garment. They're not worried about getting hot they're going to get hot and sweaty no matter what on a cross country course that lasts for 12 minutes. But, you know, hunters and jumpers, they're not used to that. They also have an aesthetic that they need to, to mm. keep. So we need to find more materials that are thin and then start to make a hybrid that a rider will want to wear. Cause as Pierre Francois said, you know, the rider has to want to wear it. You know, we can create anything right. to protect riders. But if you're riding around like the Michelin man and you can't move your neck, what's what good is that going to do you? That's a, a great way of describing the importance of self-image in the show jumping world, Danielle. Thank you for that. that was brilliantly <laughs> worded. Um, Marie, let's let me ask you this. So Pierre Francois and Neb Danielle has also talked about neck protection. And that's something I, I want to focus on. What what can you say about how these safety vests help protect the neck of the rider and specifically that such a vulnerable part of the body? Okay, so I can start and Pierre-Francois can go deeper into the technical parts. Um, on our side for Horse Pilot, of mm -hmm. course, when uh, In Emotion designed it and developed it and uh, certified it, uh, there are several... Um, controversy, you know, whether it has to go very high in your neck or not. Ours don't go as high as others because we were thinking when we developed it, and please, Pierre-Francois, stop me if uh, I'm wrong in my English, that if it goes too high, first of all, it's going to push the helmet and make the helmet goes forward and break the nose. This is something we've seen in horse riding. So this is one thing we wanted to avoid is having an airbag that will, will be will deploy too high in the neck, bang the helmet and push the helmet forward in front. And also because um, the human body is made to absorb a minimum of trauma. Uh, it, it is, as, as we mentioned earlier, it's a beautiful uh, thing, the human body. And if you are blocking everything, meaning your neck, your pole, and everything is completely blocked and uh, immobilized, it can be worst during an accident the the body needs to have a minimum of uh, movement uh, how do you say uh, possibility you know what it, it has to be able to to move if you are blocking everything it can be worst uh, and then pierre francois can go forward with more technical um arguments. No, i think Ma marie what uh, was really quite clear I, neck neck is uh, one of the most complex part of the body and um and the type of injuries that can impact the neck part uh, are very uh, various uh, you can have uh, torsion you can have steering 
you can have compression. Uh, you can have also a uh, wide splash. So at the end, it's just that uh, the inertia of the heads impacting the ground is just moving too far. So when you when you we are working with uh, biomechanicians, uh, working on uh, on mannequins, and to be honest, sometimes on dead bodies. Uh, to analyze uh, uh, post-traumatic uh, crashes and the, the performance of, uh, of productions. What we see is um, the neck has a freedom of liberty, which is uh, into a, a certain level is okay, which is, let's say, an elastic part. Unless when you move too far, so you go above the limit of the body, and then it's where it's, it, we are generating an, uh, uh, injuries. So our strategy is to, to rise up the, the, the cushion and to just keep the neck into a range of movements that is allowed by the body. Of course, we are designing airbags that have to fit with different morphologies, different body shapes. Mm. We have big, big guys, small ladies, a big, a big neck, small necks. So it's a kind of something, it's something that have to have to save in the majority of the case. And of course, we, we want to avoid any risk of additional injuries. So the idea is try to reduce the movement of the neck especially in the back with the wide splash, but keep the ability of the body to roll. Because when you roll, you are dissipating energy that you are, you are, you are having. The energy of the speed is like uh, the, the, the speed, uh, the square at square level, if you remember your equations during <laughs> high school. Uh, so the idea is energy is what creates uh, injuries. So the more energy you have by riding your horse, the more energy you have to dissipate when you crash. When you can roll, it's exactly what judo guys are doing when they roll on the floor. So we need to keep some, some freedom of liberty to keep on rolling, but avoid to go above the, uh, the body uh, limits. So that's how we have designed our, uh, let's say, um, neck production. Catherine, you're at uh, Wellington, and just the other day, team rider Laura Kraut suffered a fall and broke her collarbone and required surgery. Which of the which of the two vests, the protective vest or the airbag vest, if you had to if you had to pick just one, because obviously both are better, there's no question about that. If you had to pick just one. What what's going to help protect the collarbone the best? Because that's such a common injury in show jumping. So what's the most helpful? So there's not a clear answer to that because it very much depends on the fall. Um, so some falls would would you would say that a body protector would be better to protect the collarbone and other falls depending on the point of impact an air vest would be better certainly an air vest is is going to give you kind of that bounce factor if you will again it's like enveloping you in in an air mattress so it would provide cushion um, you know, for the collarbone, for sure. But if this was a, a pinpoint impact where the injury was caused because she was, you know, being stepped on or, or something of that nature, then in that case, the body protector um, would likely be better. So it, it, it's difficult to say in most cases, um, based on a specific for example, fracture, um, which would be better because it is dependent on the fall. But we do know, for example, that body protectors, there are certain parts of the body that aren't protected. So body protectors don't provide hip coverage in most cases. Um, they don't provide neck coverage. And, and frankly, most of my clients, when they come to me, one of the first things I'm asking is, what are your prior injuries and what is your safety priority in terms of you know, what you're trying to protect? And there's a large volume of people that are saying that their tailbone is really important and the tailbone is covered both by an air vest as well as a body protector, but also that the neck is super important. And if, if the neck is the priority, then that immediately starts leaning us into the air vest conversation. Okay. So if I may step in on the collarbone, so the collarbone fractures are actually caused by falling on your shoulder. So what, what the only protection that you can actually have to protect your collarbone is a shoulder protector. And those come in either additions to the, to the foundation garment, which you've probably seen them on event riders in the UK. They mm -hmm. kind of look like little wings. Um, and those will actually dissipate the energy enough to reduce collarbone injuries or collarbone fractures by 80%. There's also a, um, a collarbone protection shirt where it's a quarter zip shirt and there are um, shoulder protectors inside in um, a little pouch 
on the shoulder. So it really just looks like, you know, a, a lady wearing a 1980s shirt with, you know, lovely shoulders. So those also will reduce collarbone fractures by 80%. And both of those products are available from different companies. Okay. Uh, may uh, I jump in there? Please. Uh, these are very, very, very good products, but we are again against the problem of aesthetic on the, on the equestrian world. Eventers are going to wear it, no problem. But when you are facing hunter riders or, or jumpers, they're, they're, not, they're, they're not wearing it because it's too flashy, because it's too big, because it's bothering them. And we are facing that problem at the moment of aesthetic versus security. There is, a, there is more and more, uh, how do you say, a lot of riders are trying to raise awareness in North America because you can tell in Europe we have been wearing those airbags, air vest, uh, body protectors way more than the US have been doing. And there is a difference of mentality between the two continents. In Europe, they don't care how they look. They're going to be to feel protected. They're going to buy a, a safety product. In, in the US, we need to, to teach the people and we need to raise awareness and it's coming slowly, but it's a different stage of mentality that is uh, growing between the two. Yeah, okay. and I would agree with that. I think the venters are the early adopters, right? Anything yep, that you offer yep. them for safety, they're like, yes, please sign me up. And, and because they understand, yeah. Yeah, and certainly what I'm seeing on the hunter-jumper side is especially if I have somebody that's already had a shoulder or a collarbone injury, they're more interested in getting into something that moving forward proactively is going to protect the shoulder. But if you're saying up front, you know, let's, let's wear, you know, the shoulder protection pad either as an attachment to the body protector or as part of a base layer, it is a little bit of a harder sell, but... I last week sold to a lady that has had a shoulder and collarbone injury and right. actually from, from Charles Owen, we, we got her shoulder protectors. So the adoption is definitely coming. Right. And it's a quarter zip that is um, white or black, just like a shirt like this. And really you only have like, you know, little pads that are about this, this big and they cup over the shoulders, you know? So it's really, it, it's slightly for me, and I'm I'm definitely from the hunter world. Aesthetically, it looks quite nice. Certainly better than the additional shoulder mm -hmm. protectors. With the are broken collarbones not the the biggest injury that happens to to riders? I mean that I don't know what the statistics say, but if I had to make a guess as far as what bone in the rider's body breaks the most, I would think the collarbone would be way ahead of everything else. Quite a regular injury, for sure. Right, okay. Danielle, let me ask you this. How far away are we from body protectors being mandatory equipment? Um, certainly not this year. And I would think that coming up in 2022, there would not be the opportunity to make them a requirement, certainly not for all of the, the demographics of USEF. Yeah, in Europe, for example, it's uh, you have in Sweden, it's all the juniors under 18. Uh, there are different, uh, but definitely it's coming everywhere. If, if I may, as, as technology providers, um, the best is for us is really to develop some things that people adopt by themselves and, and make pe many things mandatory. Sometimes it's the, it's the worst gift that you can do for technology. Right. Uh, we, we are airbag producers, so of course people can think, okay, let's let's, and we are part of the of the mem of the, the different uh, federations in motorcycles, in horse riding. Um, our, our strategy is to develop product by listening to the feedbacks of users in terms of comfort and productions to make them adopt the technology by itself. And I guess when we when we be around something like 60, 70 percent of people using those technologies in a, in a given e events. Then, then we can we can push the, the, the rules to, to let's say address the last thirty percent. It's exactly what happens in MotoGP in uh, in, in the Olympic ski racing. Uh, so so the thing is, if we want to have the community of of us riders uh, ad adopt those technologies, we have to listen to them, keep on improving the systems, and make the systems penetrate the market by itself above above let's say the major at least above around 40, 50 percent. Right. That's great. So we have a question from one of our viewers this uh, today, and I want to get some opinion on this. 
This is from Laura Crump Anderson. Do you all have opinions on exercise outside of the TAC to improve fitness and reduce risk of injury or improve outcome of a fall? So I'm going to start with that one. Um, today's world's a little different. I remember doing a clinic with um, Captain Canada with Ian Miller when I was a junior. And one of the days we actually practiced falling off. And, uh, you know, he, he showed us how to properly fall off. Today, you can't do that. Um, we should do that. We should be practicing how to fall from a horse. That's a very important skill to learn how to protect yourself and, and, and keep and roll away from the horse and that sort of thing. But unfortunately in, in today's society that, uh, could not happen. So, um, that that's one of the issues we would have as far as, you know, protecting the riders, but it is very frustrating when you, you're there, you're taking away a, an important skill from a rider, but just because you'd be worried about a lawsuit. Does anyone, um, Catherine, do you have an, a thought as far as helping the riders uh, protect themselves when they're not on a horse to prepare for riding? Yeah, so I think there's there's two points here. One, there actually is a company out there called Landsafe that is going around doing clinics off of, uh, kind of think of it like a mechanical bull, but it's a mechanical horse, um, with air mats, teaching people how to fall to, to minimize risk of injury. So while you're not falling off of a live horse, like I remember my trainers making me do emergency distance yeah. rounds for my galloping <laughs> ponies. We're not doing we that, do. but, but there, there, there is a dedicated company that that's what their mission is, is teaching people how to fall. Um, I think part of Laura's question is also around fitness and, and, you know, Thankfully, riding is a sport where you can come from any background, any fitness level and, and enjoy the sport. Um, but I know from my own experience, the stronger that I am in my core, the more effective I am in the saddle. So I think certainly having a, a well-rounded fitness routine makes you more effective in the saddle, makes you more confident in the saddle, um, you know, helps you potentially you know, reduce the risk of falling, but it's a dangerous sport. Horses are horses. They have minds of their own. And sometimes no matter how well prepared you are, you're going to fall. Right. And I think it's, it's important to add that our demographics, you know, riding is something you can do from a very young age until a very Captain Canada's perfect example. You know, you can ride until at the Olympic level until, you know, and, and gold medal like Nick Skelton at 59. So I think that as our demographics start to age, um, we are looking at greater opportunities for protection because we want to keep riding, you know, and, and just because you are a little bit older, why shouldn't you be able to ride, you know, put on an air vest, put on a body protector and put your helmet on and go and enjoy it. And that's interesting you say that about Nick, because uh, he had previously suffered a broken neck. And, right. Uh, recovered from that. Um, he's also an upcoming guest on the show. So I'm very excited to, to be speaking with Mr. Skelton very soon. So speaking of tragic injuries um, in North America, what really brought this all to light and to the forefront was the injury to Irish Olympian Kevin Babington in 2019 when he suffered a fall in, in the Grand Prix. So for those of you that have, that have seen the, the fall, um, I know that talking to Kevin and Diana, his wife, they both feel that if he was wearing a protective vest or an inflatable vest, um, there was a, there's a better chance he would have been okay and not be, you know, paralyzed from the chest down and in a wheelchair. Um, can, can anyone speak to that as far as, you know, having, you know, seen that fall? Do you, do you think, is there a better chance that he would have walked away from that if he was wearing a vest? Anybody can speak to that? Uh, Marie, have you seen that? I haven't seen the fall, but um, people have been explaining it to me. It's very hard to say afterwards, okay, it would have been better with or not. Uh, what we have to keep in mind is that even for professional, it's still a dangerous sport. You never know what can happen, even with someone that is such a good rider as Kevin is. But having, um, it's the what <coughs> Jeff was always saying about passive and active protection. Having an airbag for sure is going to help. It cannot get worse with an airbag or with a, an airbag vest or with a hard shell. It cannot get worse. This additional protection can only provide you extra protection. So maybe yes, maybe not. It's very difficult to say for Kevin's case. 
But for sure, when you are a professional and you get in the ring, and even if you are the most talented in the world and you have the best world ever, if you fell off and you broke some ribs or if you break your shoulders, you're going to be out of the saddle for weeks. And this is your job. You need to ride in order to, to train your horses. To It's it's your job. You need, this is how you make money. So by having an airbag, if this can avoid for you to have uh, any accident, any injury, and you can keep riding and be safe, why not? And this is uh, what we are, everybody is trying to figure it out, is that whether you're an amateur or you're a professional rider, uh, uh, sorry, a safety vest is going to prote protect you more than if you have none. Okay. Exactly. And this is what I think is important. It's to say, okay, even if you're professional and you're number four in the world or no, even number one in the world, if you flip over with your best horse and uh, this has never happened and you break something and you're injured, you cannot ride anymore. You're losing all the horse shows, you're losing... So... Right. That's the point of view I have on uh, professionals. I think Maria well, said it yeah. so well so very well that any sort of addition is so beneficial to to lessen severity of falls right no absolutely no, so. I, mean, I mean and and, yeah. I, and i will add um what, what we're facing today in europe as well and us is um we we have to be in 10 in lockdown because there is no some rain so remaining uh, bed in hospitals for people so more than ever uh, we try to avoid going to the hospital whatever the spot it, it is so I would say we all need our part of freedom and exercise our sports because we can't go in, in, to concerts, we can't go to stadiums in France, in Europe, we can't go to restaurants. We still can do some stuff. Riding horse is part of the things which are which are allowed, but it's not the right time to go to the hospital. So for sure, today, optimizing yeah. your chance of being safe, and if you crash, this is something possible, um, optimizing <laughs> your chance of not go to the hospital is very important. And the last statistics we have on the... On the um, more than 1,000 crash we had is, well, again, airbags can help you to avoid going to the hospital in more than 50% of the case. Yeah, true. Dear friends, well, I wanna ask you um, this question and start with you. So a few weeks ago, there was a Grand Prix in, in California and the rider was coming down the final line and uh, the horse jumped very hard and, and big at one of the fences and then he got, just a little bit out of the saddle, like not to the side or, or just just very slightly it popped and that inflated a safety vest and he jumped the last three jumps with the safety vest um, popped up and which and OK, it didn't actually seem to negatively affect him um, and the horse didn't even lose its focus. It was a pretty neat thing to see, but obviously that's not ideal. We don't want the safety vest going off when you're on course, never mind in you know jumping, you know, meter 55 fences. Um, so as from the technology aspect of that, what, you know, what can be done to make sure that doesn't happen or is there, is that just a risk you have to take? No, uh, as I was saying, uh, any feedbacks uh, that say that we are not at the 100% case of detection crash and zero false triggering, we are not ready. We are not, let's say, perfect. So of course there is some improvement. First thing is, it's really important to tune the length of the lanyards uh, for any type of riders, even sometimes depending on the horse and depending on what, uh, the type of horse. So uh, the longer it is, the more safety you have before force triggering. But in some cases, if the horse is not too high, you have the risk to fall down with something which is not inflated uh, or you're not inflated enough. That's why the length of the lanyard is important. The speed of inflation is key because if you... Uh, retard the, the, the inflation time the, 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 when the lanyard put off you need to inflate faster to get ready uh, at the first impact um, we are working on, on also different technologies of uh, elasticity on the on the lanyard and a, a magnet system that you can pull off very fast if you forgot just to to remove the lanyard when you uh, go off the, the, the houses things happened uh, to me a few weeks ago and uh, hopefully there's a red small strap that you can pull off in one end and go very fast uh, and and you have to keep in mind that wearable systems, active wearable safety and smart wearable safety is just at the beginning. Um, and the more users we have, the more feedbacks we got. And uh, we also said part of our users are part of the R&D team. So you can see improvements. And the good thing is uh, wearable systems are used in ski, in motor motorcycles. And all of those enable companies as us to use all those different sports and feedbacks and investment to keep on investing to promote new technologies. So we are working with our pilot on a fully 
electronic code system. So no linears, no any link with the horse. It will be based on a, on a small brain, this, this size, that will be stick in the back, uh, that can be, that, that we use to analyze in, in real time the movement of the body and decide to detect and uh, in, 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 uh, inflate the airbags. So in this situation, no risk of force triggering because I forgot the linear or something. But this requires getting data using uh, testers, and uh, this is, let's say, uh, on its way. So the you know this is this is still a pretty new technology, and uh, obviously it's going to be rapidly changing soon enough. Catherine, do you have a thought on? Um, you know, I didn't realize the lanyards could be adjusted in length, mm -hmm. so that that's good to know. Um, and one of our one of our viewers has just talked about here. They're talking about in the motorcycle world about some leashless air vests being developed and that sort of thing. Are, are you seeing that, Catherine, or what do you have to say with that? So I think that's exactly what Pierre Francois is talking about: is is these gyroscopic systems that don't require you to tether to your saddle and are using sensors to detect if you're falling. Um, but, but the rider and thermal that you talked about, Marie, and I actually had a conversation after that yeah. happened and, and to Pierre Francois's point, the, the lanyard length is very important. And it's one of the first things that I educate on when somebody buys an air vest is how to set your, your saddle strap and your lanyard to the appropriate length. Having said that, there are still going to be situations where you get jumped loose or get left behind and maybe you should have <laughs> fallen and miraculously you didn't either because you're a really good rider or you landed in the saddle lucky and your air vest might trigger when you don't want it to but you'd rather have it trigger than not trigger when you really need it to right yeah. that is a tough one it's, and it's difficult when with horses being so reactive you know some horses being so reactive to sound um, and of course that going off and I assume there's no way to mute the airbag. To, to <laughs> yes, but, I, but I'm going to jump in on that uh, because we are, I mean, we are selling a lot of airbags in Europe and the US and as for today, I never, never got um, a feedback from a customer saying that he scared his horse. Never. Oh, okay. So I don't know if it happened with other brands, but for us, it never happened. I even got some riders who were very surprised because they were telling me, okay, I forgot to unhook myself when I was back at the stable and I was on a five years old mm -hmm. and it didn't spook. And, and the, mm -hmm. the customers, I think I was very surprised. Well, when you're in the movement, most of the time, uh, people need to understand that when, when you're falling off and the airbag is inflating, uh, the horse is not going to focus on the noise. It's focusing on you falling off. It's not focusing on the noise of your airbag at all. Okay. And um, for people who have, um, who have deployed the airbag by mistake because they forgot to unhook themselves, I never heard a problem. So I hope mm. it's not going to happen. But most of the time, I mean, it's, it's such a fast noise. And even for spooky horses, I mean, never got really uh, big problems about it. Yeah, that's I think funny. that's probably the number one question that I get is, is it going to spook my horse? And I think there's a little bit of a conspiracy theory out there. You know, there's stories floating around of it scared my horse half to death and he took off. And, you know, can a horse spook? Absolutely. Again, they're horses, you know, they have minds of their own. So it certainly can happen. And I'm sure that it it has happened. But um, to Marie's point, the horse is normally focused on something else if you're falling, that you're not in the place that you're supposed to be. A lot of times that scares them or they, you know, they're in a situation that they're not comfortable with. And that's usually what they are reacting to versus the sound. Right. I want to change tracks for just a moment and, and discuss helmets. Um, I'm a big proponent now of helmets. I mean, I grew up in you know, I'd only put a helmet on when we were jumping. And that was always a rule in the barn, you know. You have to wear a helmet if you're jumping. Um, it didn't always happen. When we were out trail riding, there was a tree and stuff. Of course, we'd jump in and we didn't wear <laughs> helmets. But um, I'm a big proponent of helmets because the helmet saved my life. I, you know, I had a bad fall and uh, the helmet, you know, it, was, it broke my back. But it, did, it didn't crush my skull as a result. So I'm a big proponent of it. But I want to ask a question to Danielle. And, you know, we talked about this yesterday. What I don't understand, and I, again, this is just my lack of knowledge and education on it, is the difference between the football helmets and the riding helmets and why we can't have that same technology in the riding helmets. And, and I'm specifically referring to 
in football, of course, you know, I mean, you can, you wear a helmet typically for a year or sometimes even those helmets go on in high school football for a long time in show jumping. Uh, apparently if, if your helmet, you know, bangs against a chair, it's now compromised and you need to, you need to have it replaced. And I'm exaggerating a little bit, but they, they are very conscious about it. once you have a fall, you do need to receive a new right. helmet. So what is it, what is the difference in the technology and why is that different? So there are two types of protection in helmets. There's the multi-impact uh, type of liners that are in football helmets. And then there are the single impact uh, liners, uh, protective mechanism in helmets such as uh, riding. There's, there's a different level of protection. There's different materials. But the crossover at the moment, I could go into details about, you know, what's in the football helmet and what's in the riding helmet and then skateboarding and, and bicycling. But the reality is, is that the Polo, USPA, now requires a NOXI standard, which is the football standard. So that's multi-impact. So the Polo, the people at USPA have recognized that they need a helmet that not only protects them in equestrian accidents that are regular, um, but they also need a multi-impact protection. So at the moment, USPA has two helmet brands that provide them helmets, both Charles Owen and Casablanca, and they both do have the Noxy standard. Again, you know, protecting against those sorts of multi-impacts. Some of those impacts would be subconcussive, and you, for instance, a football player is said to have potentially 50 subconcussive impacts per game. Those, as we all are starting to learn, and you may know this prior, but those sorts of impacts are cumulative. And that's where we, you know, in the previous years, we've seen that those impacts can then create CTE and there are other types of mental illnesses that can come from these sorts of head injuries. But the Charles Owen Sovereign, which is the polo helmet that we have made, actually has all three standards. The British standard, which is PASA 015, which is the helmet um, standard that protected Laura Kraut from her, um, the stud impact on from her horse. The the European specification, which is VG1, and then the ASTM standard. And then we also have the Noxy. So our sovereign polo helmet takes all of them together. And I believe Casablanca has um, also uh, additional standards. So those polo players are getting protection at so many different levels. Now, that means that the liner would be different. So we are using a Viconics liner which is a, a brand new, um, it's not EPS, expanded polystyrene, and it's not EPP, expanded polypropylene, but it is a whole new material that has great potential and use in the coming years in all helmets. Hmm. Okay, so where does, to, to make that sort of thing happen, so you're saying, you know, basically the polo riders are more protected than the show jumpers. So where does that need to come from as far as to, to make that change um, in, in that technology in, in show jumping? Like what, does that come from the Federation or USEF <laughs> or does that come from individuals or where, where does that start? Catherine, can you, can you answer that? You know, you're in the sport and I know helmets are not something you deal with, but where does the safety regulations start? Well, I think it's multi-directional. I think it comes from funding and research that tells us that we are continuously finding more effective materials and designs. Um, to Pierre-Francois's earlier point, I think it comes also from education and awareness and people making the choice to really look for those types of products and make the choice to use them. And then from the Federation perspective, putting in place standards to ensure that people are using things that are at a minimum level that we know is going to provide better protection. Okay, so... 
So essentially be, you know, be proactive, get educated and, and figure out what works best for you. And then, um, you know, that that's the best way to be safe. And, you know, whether that be your, your diet or your fitness program or whatever it happens to be, you know, make, make those choices um, that, that are best for you. Um, Marie, just, just to, to finish up on, on your thoughts um, with the safety, you, you've been in the business for a long time. Um, <laughs> What what's like the biggest change you've seen from a mentality standpoint for for riders looking to have a safer experience on a horse? Well, that's a little bit what we were seeing when you were when we were younger. Our generation, we used to ride without helmet, and if you look at it twenty years later now, everybody rides with a helmet, even when they're training. Training most of the professional also now are careful about wearing helmets. So why not now the safety vest? You can see that through the years um, in our industry, people are more and more aware of the safety part and we are getting to it. The, the helmets are the best uh, example. 20 years ago, nobody was wearing helmets. Nobody realized really that it was so important and it could save your life. And nowadays, you, it's very unusual to find riders or even professional are going to tell you, oh, no, I don't need my helmet. I mean, it's it's really into mentality now. So now that they understood that they have to protect their head, maybe at some point it's going to raise, uh, sorry, to, um, to come all also with the safety jackets. And we are already seeing it. A lot of professional got to it. A lot of amateurs now are wearing it. Unfortunately, I'm not, I cannot travel because of the, the, the pandemic, but uh, Catherine told me it's unbelievable at WEF how many riders now are re wearing safety vests. Whether last year you could not see all these riders with it. So we are getting to it. People start to understand that it's important to be protected and it's coming there. So once, you know, once there will be um, more and more people understanding, more and more people will be protected. So we are going towards the safety more and more. If I was clear, sorry if I wasn't clear. I was <laughs> myself. No, no, that absolutely. And I want to thank all of you for for coming onto the show and, and providing this sort of information for people because it's something. Again, even someone like myself, I don't know much about the safety vest because it is a fairly new technology in our world. And uh, my daughter competes and, and is in show jumping, and um, it's you know I want to protect her. So it's, you know, figuring out how how best to do that and. And how best to do that for everybody. So education is such an important thing. And I think what Pierre Francois, what you're developing there is is so great. And I'm really excited to see the changes you make in the future. And you know, you're also knowledgeable on this. And I would really encourage people to do their research and reach out to to people like my panelists here. Don't just go to Google to do your research. Go, go to people that really know what they're talking about and and get the background information and then make your own decisions on, on what you feel is the best way to to be comfortable when on your horse and so i want to thank everyone for joining us um it's been great that uh, to have this panel discussion so thank you so much to all my guests next week on the show we have irish star shane sweetenham is coming on he just won a big five-star grand prix in wellington the first one uh first one of the year and uh He's, he's a very interesting character, so really looking forward to getting to know Shane a little better and bring his story to, to all the viewers at the Horse Network. I want to thank the Equivault.com for sponsoring this show. It's the best online resource for all your show jumping exercises out there, so check them out. Um, whatever you're struggling with with your horse, you're going to find that. Um, you're going to find a training module with it, maybe lead changes. Maybe you're having trouble with lead changes, or maybe it's how to make a turn properly to a jump. All of that, check that out. There's lots of training modules on theequivault.com. I want to thank Carly Sparks making this all happen, uh, running this early show, and, and we've got guests from all over the world here. And so not, not an easy production to put together. So thank you so much to her. And as always, ride safely and respect the horse. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Jay. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.